Okay, hi, we're all back now and we're going to be looking at video number three. Video number three on nuclear power. And for this video, we're going to be looking at uh, three things. It's going to take a little bit of time, but uh, I think it's quite interesting, actually. And it's going to answer three very important questions. Number one, how much energy do we get? As we know, we have different ways in which an atom, uh, specifically an unstable atom, will decay. It will break into two parts and we'll, we'll lose some energy uh, off of it. Or rather, we're going to get some energy out of it. And the question is, is, how much energy do we actually get? And then number two is, when does it decay? When does this happen? Like, do we know when an atom will decay? And this is where we're going to talk a little bit about what half-life of an atom means. Perhaps you've already heard of that. Uh, you're supposed to have heard about it in Science 10 and perhaps in chemistry, but we're going to talk about it a little bit more now and more in a physics way. And then lastly, and this is going to lead us to the fourth video, is there another way to do this? Is there another way other than just waiting for an atom to decay? And thankfully, yes. Yes, there is. So, without further ado, let's... Uh, look at our first question. And the first question was, how much energy do we get? Now, I just want to review what we've already done. We've been talking about alpha and beta decay. And so what we know is that we have a, well, let's just assume this is a unstable, unstable nucleus. Uh, it could be anything. It could be uranium-235. It could be any sort of, uh, nucleus that is under going to go something such as, for example, uh, we'll just assume we have an alpha decay. And if we have an alpha decay, uh, we know that a few things are going to happen. I'm going to have my atom split into two parts. I'm going to have uh, one big thing. I'm going to have a, a little tiny alpha particle. Let's just go, that's my alpha particle. This is the new nucleus. This is the remaining part. And I'm also going to have a little phew, this, and you might remember this is my gamma ray, my, my little light particle that's going to fly off. Now, what I want to look at there is, um, well, I have my original mass. We'll call this um, MO, the original mass of this. And now that I've split this up, I should have two parts. And if I look at this, I would have, say, mass 1 for the nucleus that's remaining, and then mass 2 for the little alpha particle. Now what's kind of uh, important to know is that if I looked at this I would say well I've got one part and I should see uh, the mass of the nucleus that's remaining plus the mass of the alpha particle to add them up should give me the original mass and what happens is that this is not true. It's not true. So where did that, where, so where is, where is the missing mass? Whoops, missing mass. In other words, not only is it not equal to it here, I'm just going to take that away. It's actually smaller. There, there's some missing, there's, there's some mass three, there's some mass three here that's, where did it go? It's from missing amount. So there's, you actually end up with less mass than what you started with. And the reason is the gamma ray. And then you say, well, wait a minute. Isn't gamma ray a light? And doesn't light have no mass? Yes. Yes, it's true. A gamma ray has no mass. Gamma ray is light. In other words, gamma ray, let's say gamma ray mass equals zero because the missing mass, missing mass turned into, turned into pure energy. Wow. Turned into pure energy. 
And that's where the missing mass came from. Well, that's where the missing mass went. I started off with a nucleus. It split into two parts. But a gamma ray is what happened to the missing mass. It changed. It changed from mass straight into energy. And this is something actually that was known for a little while due to Einstein's famous, very famous mass energy equivalence formula. And most people think of it as energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Now that's, I'm sorry to say, not actually the correct equation. Uh, this is the equation that people uh, are generally told. The real equation is that energy, sorry, energy squared is equal to the absolute value of your momentum squared times the speed of light squared plus mass, and I'm going to put a little O there, I'll explain that in a second, squared C to the 4. So that's quite a few things there. Let's look at this now. So first off, this is the momentum. This is the momentum of the system. So if my mass uh, is moving around, uh, it actually has some extra energy that I have to take into account. Sort of a, I guess you could almost say there's a certain amount of kinetic energy, but we relate it to momentum times the speed squared. So it's a little different than kinetic energy, but we use this. Then we actually have um, MO. Now what is MO? It means resting mass. Now, this is something that we learn later on, especially in Physics 12, but the truth is, is that the mass of an object is actually going to be different as it gets faster in its velocity. So you can't actually calculate exactly what a mass is all the time. You have to consider what the mass is when it's not moving. This becomes very important. And of course, C, you should all know this already, is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So the question is, is, well, why do we always see this? Well, usually because we, uh, for, for a, whoops, we're looking at a single system, so we're saying for a single atom, single atom, unmoving, or at least moving very little, uh, we can say the momentum equals zero. Therefore, I get E squared equals M squared C fourth. And I can square root both sides and get E equals M C squared, which is where it comes from. That's actually how we get that equation. Now, I haven't reached the point where I'm saying, okay, so how much energy? <coughs> Excuse me. How much energy can I get out of this thing? So let's move on and just try to figure it out. Let's assume... Um, it's going to depend upon the mass of the object, of course. Uh, so let's consider um, let's consider a hydrogen. Hydrogen atom. Okay, so what do I got? Um, the mass of a hydrogen. Let's get a little capital H is equal to one point, you just look it up on the periodic table, 1.0079, that's my atomic mass, and that is in grams per mole. So those of you doing chemistry probably recognize this already. And uh, what is that? Uh, that's actually, if I had to, if I had to work that out, uh, that would be equal to 1.674 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms for one single atom. Now that's not very much. That's that's really not very much. And if I did that, I'd say, okay, well, 
E equals mc squared. What do I got? Well, I'm going to have mass of 1.674 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And I'm going to multiply by the speed of light squared. That's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters, oops, meters per second squared. And what do I get? How much energy do I get? Oh my god, a whopping 1.51 times 10 to the negative 10 joules. Oh my god, that's really, really small. That's tiny. That's uh, not much. Uh, very over, very underwhelming. Uh, just not a very happening thing. But, of course, there's always a but in physics. There's always a, wait a minute, hold on. Let's think about this. How many moles? The number of moles of hydrogen in one kilogram. How much in one kilogram of uh, hydrogen? Well, um, let's think about that. That's, uh, well, how are we going to do that? That's, uh, well, there's a thousand grams per 1.0079 grams per mole, which will give me how many moles? That will give me 992.2 moles of hydrogen. Okay, so that's how many moles of hydrogen, but okay, so now once again, hopefully most of you can remember what a mole is. That's uh, one mole is equal to six point, hopefully you're all saying this out loud right now, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Okay, so that means how many atoms? So that means if I take a mole, and so if I take this, and I multiply it by this, whoops, that's equal to how many atoms? 5.975 times 10 to the 26 atoms. So this is where, um, well, things look a little different because yes, I get this much energy from one atom. But if I've got this many atoms and I multiply it by that much energy for each single atom, I am going to get roughly, let's draw it in red because it's so special, 9 times 10, roughly now, 9 times 10 to the 16 joules. That's roughly 90 million billion joules of energy. Now that's the kind of energy I'm interested in. That's a beautiful amount. In fact, wow, holy cow, that means if I have only one kilogram, one kilogram of hydrogen, I can produce that much energy, which means I've got a, I've got something I can really work with now. Now I'm kind of interested. But the question is, is exactly, um, when is it going to happen? So this is something we want to talk about. This is what we want to talk about now is, well, when does it happen? So let's just look at that for a second. What I want to talk about is half-life. So what is half-life? Um, I want to make sure that we understand what this means. When does an atom decay? And the problem here is that what we've been talking about has been what's called natural decay. In other words, an atom just spontaneously, suddenly out of the blue, decaying and splitting, uh, releasing that little bit of energy. Now, the problem is, is that a half-life doesn't mean that that is exactly when an atom is going to split. In fact, we never know when an atom is going to split. Now, let me, let me give you an example here. Um, we've got a, uh, hydrogen three atom. Now this is a, a slightly unstable hydrogen uh, atom where we have, well, you can tell we've got a proton and two neutrons uh, hanging out in its nucleus. It's very unstable. It wants to decay and the half-life of uh, H3 uh, is uh, basically around 12 years. And you can see it up on the chart there. This is the half-life. Now the question is, is when is it going to decay? 
Well, let's just watch and wait and see what happens. Okay, there it is. Oop, there, it decayed. And when did it happen? Well, it looks like it happened around, I don't know, two, three years. So that's not exactly happening at 12 years. Uh, let's try again. Let's go. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, wait. It's still going. It's been 20 years. Oh, 24 years. And suddenly now it decays. And you're thinking, well, what's the good of half-life? I mean, I don't even, if you don't even know when it's going to decay, what's the good of a half-life? And notice it, it, it loses that one little bit and becomes, it turns into helium. Uh, let's try again. Uh, nah, nah, four years, five years, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Oh, thirteen 13 years. 13 years it drops. And I keep doing this. I think, wow, this is not really, this is not really helping me very much. Look at this thing. Oh my God, it's going to go, holy cow, is this thing even going to decay? Oh, 35 years later, it decays. And if you look at this, you think, well, this half-life doesn't seem very useful. But what you have to remember, and just think back on when we were calculating how many hydrogen atoms are in one kilogram, we're dealing with not just, well, in this case, I've, I've done four four single atoms and the thing about half-life is that it is a uh, statistical number in other words it is the on average that is when most of the atoms will be uh, decaying and so it's better to look at this in terms of many atoms at the same time so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna add a bunch of atoms here I'm gonna just pause this and now I've added a whole pile of atoms. Now, if you look up there, you're going to see all of these atoms all spontaneously decaying. They're happening randomly all throughout time. And then, now let's just pause for a moment. How long has it been? It's exactly the half-life. And then I have roughly, actually, it's past the half-life now, isn't it? I've got a whole pile of atoms now half decayed. Half of them are decayed. Now, it's not exactly half, but once again, I'm only dealing with a 100 atoms here. Let's just look at them all. Let's start over. Let's reset and start over. Now, just watch what happens. Now, what we're saying is, when do I get half of the atoms decaying? Remember, some of them have decayed like almost immediately. Some of them at this point some of this point and then pause so I'm slightly past the half-life point and how many how many of my large bucket of atoms have actually decayed it turns out pretty much half of them has decayed and wh what you find is that the more atoms that you use like in this case I used a hundred atoms a hundred atoms and I got pretty close to half and when you start dealing with things on the level of 6 times 10 to the power of 26 atoms, this number gets pretty accurate because you're, the larger the number, the higher your accuracy. And so what's going to happen is that every single time you're going to find your atoms, just watch this now, not every time, of course. It's not always going to be exactly right, but you're going to get a pretty good number. And like I said, all you need is just a few extra atoms boom see a little bit over but still we're getting a 50 50 thing going on really really close and if i did this a whole bunch of times maybe like a few thousand times on average i'm going to get exactly at my half-life point so this is a useful thing but it's also not very helpful if i want to get if i want to definitely get an energy out of something the question is is well what what do i do because this doesn't entirely solve my problem it allows me to understand how half-life works and uh, if you don't understand how this works if this video isn't helping you entirely please come talk to me about this i'll explain it even more but what i want to talk about is okay if um if this is what happens when they naturally decay that means i could be waiting years on on an atom just to decay and give me a little tiny bit of an energy but hey, we're, we're very greedy people and we want to get our energy now. What do we do? What do we do? So here I want to suggest that there is another act, uh, thing we can do. Now, what you're looking at here is a, a little chart of a uh, 
nucleus here. And in this case, now we're looking at uranium-235, a, a very, very unstable atom. It's, it's, it's ready to pop at any moment. It could happen now, but it could also, like I said, it could happen years from now. And this is probably the big problem of uranium-235 is that I'd, I'd rather it decay at any point. Now, you see a little chart down here, and, and what we have is the total energy of this this atom is displayed as the yellow line and the problem is is that even though 235 is unstable it does have what this this blue line that it needs to get over so in other words for this thing to split it would need to be have a little extra energy a little push and now you might remember what we had talked about in the very first video what is nuclear power nuclear power is the ability to give a tiny little push to something that basically makes it suddenly release all its energy, just like you would tip a very unstable building. And it's exactly what's going on here. Just take a look. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send a neutron and throw it into the nucleus. And so it's going to have one extra neutron. And what this is going to do is it's going to make the entire nucleus even more unstable. And it does give it that little push. So let's take a look now. Just let's just do it. Boom. Throw in the thing and pop. I just simply throw in a neutron, it gains a little more extra energy, and this allows the two parts to split apart. Basically, I'm, I'm getting much more energy uh, that the electrostatic energy is, is wanting to repel all these things apart. And so what I do is I add in a neutron, and that gives me just enough to basically allow it to pass that threshold and split. And so this is what I'm interested in where I have a neutron and it's thrown into the uranium-235 nucleus. And uh, that actually changes the, uh, the nucleus itself. We, we get different uh, nucleus coming out. They're no longer actually uranium. They're uh, rubidium and cesium, actually. Um, and this is great. I, can, I could do this. And so I, that way, I know exactly when I'm going to release the energy. I'm going to get it exactly whenever I shoot it. Now, there's, of course, a problem because I've got millions and billions and billions and billions of atoms, and I can't just grab a gun and start shooting nuclei at everything. This is just going to take forever. I'd be like, okay, there's one. Okay, i got a little tiny bit. Okay, good. Let's do it again. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is going to take a little while. I need something that's going to help me out. And this is where... Uh, understanding how chain reactions work is going to really, really help me. Because what you'll notice is that when I shoot my nucleus in, pieces fly off. In fact, not even just pieces, but pieces plus another whole bunch of uh, neutrons and other things are just everywhere. And so let's just, for example, say we had a room and I didn't just have one uranium-235, but I included, say, let's say a few others. Now, now when I shoot, what's going to happen? Well, in fact, let me add a few more. Whee! Okay, now i got a room really, really full of uranium-235. So when I shoot the first one, let's just watch carefully what happens. Boom! They shoot off and hit all the rest. I get this giant chain reaction. Now, this is going to change if I have fewer. Let's just have fewer here. Pop, pop. Ooh. I don't hit all of them, do I? Ooh, almost do. I miss some. So, I, so if I want to get all of them to react, I actually need to fill up that room uh, with more than a couple there. Let me see. Let me try that. Uh, almost. Ooh. Maybe not, well, not quite everybody. So it has a lot to do with whether or not I have the right amount of atoms in there. But if I have um, the right amount of uh, atoms inside, I can create this giant chain reaction. So a chain reaction is simply where uh, the explosion of, no, I'm sorry, not the explosion, but the splitting of one atom releases little particles that in turn hit other atoms. And then when they break up, they hit another bunch of other atoms. And we create this chain reaction. This is what we call it, a chain reaction of hits on each other. Now, uh, 
You've seen this uh, chain reaction happen before. In other words, a nuclear bomb. A uh, nuclear bomb is an example of an uncontrolled chain reaction. So there are two types of chain reaction. Maybe we should bring this up here right away. Let's just uh, turn it on. So let's just say this right now. Uh, uh, let me get write this down for you. So an uncontrolled You see chain react. Let's just call this all chain reactions. We have uncontrolled. So, for example, uh, that would be like whoosh. Make this look pretty. Not not to say that nuclear bombs are pretty, but they do uh, look awfully interesting. Uh, so, a nuclear bomb. A a nuke. A nuke is an example of an uncontrolled chain reaction, but you can also have a controlled chain reaction, and this is what we're kind of interested in. You get a whole lot of energy out of a nuclear bomb, but all it does is really just explode and blow people up, and that's kind of uh, not interesting to most people. What we're interested in is uh, something where perhaps you've seen these smokestacks. Uh, a nuclear power plant where I'm getting, uh, let's just, let me see, a little few... I'm just trying to draw a few little electrical lines from the little power generator here. There's the electricity going off. Yay, electricity. Yay. Electrical power gained from some controlled chain reaction. So I want to control the reaction somehow. That's what I'm interested in. So first off, um, I need to have, let's just look at it. To control it, I need critical mass, by the way. Critical mass is needed, this is one of the words you need to know, is needed for a chain reaction. And this simply means just what I was talking about before, earlier, when I was just showing you the, the, the chain reactions here, is that, uh, for example, if I only have uh, a few, um, yeah, I get a few reactions but I don't get everybody I don't actually get a chain reaction I just get a, a small number of my atoms uh, reacting to each other but if I have enough if I have enough then boom suddenly I create I have what's called critical mass I've got just enough where I'm going to make every single atom inside my area uh, react with each other so we also need the right number uh, the amount of uh, material uh, but we also, if we want to control it, um, I kind of need a, a few things in, in mind. So let's just, let's just go through this. Um, I'm just going to copy paste here. Let's just, so what we're saying, okay. So these are the things for control. So this is what, this is what we're going to say here. Let me see. Let me just write this. For a controlled, whoops, that looks like I can. Controlled chain reaction. You need critical mass. Okay, so you need critical mass. It's the smallest amount. I don't want too much or else it's going to get out of control. The smallest amount needed. Okay, I don't, I don't want to suddenly have this thing turning into a nuclear bomb. That would be really bad. Everyone would be sad. I also need to have the uh, right material. So generally, I want the kind of unstable atom that I can control. Uh, right. So a uh, the unstable isotope we were talking about at the very beginning. We want to use the right one. Each one is going to react a little differently and a little more quickly than each. So what I'm looking for is something like uh, example uh, uranium-235 is an incredibly useful one for us. It's a good material. We'd like to use it. And then lastly, um, we need to contain it. We need to contain it. Contain it or slow it down. So um, let's just go back one more time to this thing. 
uh, so I need to have um, the right material. Let's use uh, 235. I also need the right amount. And also, as it turns out, if I'm interested in really making this work, I should put it all inside of a containment vessel. Some sort of containment vessel will help me as well because that in ensures that everything is going to also just not fly everywhere. I don't want to really have everything just like fly into all directions and, for example, fly and hit people. I don't really want to have a chain reaction where the people who are working in the plant are continually getting bombarded with uh, flying nuclear uh, particles. Uh, that would be incredibly bad. That would mean everybody who works at any kind of nuclear reactor would be getting cancer constantly. So the one other thing you want to do, you might notice what I said here, is I also said slow it down. And the question is, is how could I slow it down? So the last thing I'm going to talk about in this video is the idea of how nuclear reactors work. So let's just see here. I've got a, um, I'm going to, I'm going to make this a little smaller here so you can see something else here. There we go. So you can see on the side here, I've got a whole bunch of little tiny uranium 235, uh, atoms, highly unstable. Here's showing my temperature and, uh, I've got how much power I'm getting and how much energy I'm getting as I do it. And if I fire the neutrons, I'm going to get this, um, little happy little uh, reaction. But then I go, oh my God, oh my God, my power is going kind of crazy, but my energy is getting right up and I'm also getting a lot of heat. Um, I don't quite like that. Um, it's not, it's not helping me as much. And I would like to adjust. I want to adjust how much that, that actually is. Let's just reset everything and try it again. And this time I'm going to show you something else we're going to do. And you can notice I've got this little thing under here. It's called a control rod. Now this is usually made out of some material that soaks up neutrons it doesn't make them bounce they don't actually it's not part of the containment uh, room it's actually a separate thing and these control rods by putting them in at a certain depth and uh, i actually mean exactly what i mean uh, as a certain depth they will produce a certain amount of slowing down of the reaction i'm just going to give you an example of that let me just fire the neutrons now and then i just put up my rods here and as you can see I'm keeping the amount, uh, the amount of power output and the temperature of this whole thing down. If it's too high, I just put up my rods and it drops right off. And that way, whoops, I can limit how much energy is produced. I can actually also control it where I produce more or less. The control rods, depending upon how deep they are, will uh, change the amount of energy I produce, but also not make the temperature increase too high where I might actually have what's known as a meltdown in my nuclear reactor. What does this actually look like? Well, I happen to have a video. This is a chain reactor uh, going on, the, uh, the reactor core. You'll notice that it's filled up with water. We're going to talk about that a little bit at another time about why there's water in here. One of the good reasons why there's water surrounding your core is that that radiation actually can't get very far in water. Water stops nuclear radiation from coming at you. So actually this pool of water makes it perfectly safe. In fact, you could actually swim in this water to a certain depth. At a certain point, then you're too close and you're gonna, you're gonna get hurt. But uh, at this point, you're perfectly safe because of this protective water layer throughout the entire rod. Now what's going to happen is that they're going to turn on this reactor and then they're going to lower the rods. These things here, these are the rods I was just telling you about that uh, help this thing work. Here we go. Let's So what you're looking at there is the nuclear reactor being turned on. So basically the initial chain reaction is being uh, taking place. That blue light is the sudden flash of all those gamma rays flying everywhere uh, and staying pretty much within that water sphere. Uh, that's what that blue light is all about. Uh, but also you saw those control rods being dipped down to control that chain reaction. 
uh, at a certain depth, and that that is a very uh, specifically controlled depth to get exactly the energy output that they want. So that's it for this video. And what we're going to do in the last video is we're going to go through in detail a nuclear reactor and how the whole thing works. Okay, I'll see you then. Take a look.